By 1976, the Bay Area had become a mecca of bioscience research. Scientists at UCSF, Stanford, and UC Berkeley had succeeded in pioneering experiments with recombinant DNA. In the mid-70s, while most venture capitalists were looking to silicon as the source for gold in the valley, Bob Swanson, then just 28, had a vision. Cells could become factories with the potential to produce an unlimited array of life-changing medicines. Bob had the instinct that the time was right for biotechnology to do something. But everybody he talked to, whether they were in industry or whether they were in academia, said, okay, kid, you know, maybe in 10 or 20 years this is going to be important. Herb Boyer, the co-inventor of recombinant DNA, listened. He saw that only through the commercialization of his discoveries could he realize their potential to revolutionize medicine. Herb was really the first and only person in Bob's rounds that was willing to take that risk. And I think Herb, Herb actually um, uh, got a lot of criticism from his academic colleagues uh, who, who then said, well, what are you doing? You know, this is, you know, this is not pure. Bob was a philosopher about risk. He would talk about it as something that needed to be done, that risk-taking was something he wanted to put in the culture of the company, that risk was something you responsibly had to go take, but that you could manage. Bob looked at that risk and recognized that with the right people, with the right talent, you could navigate that risk. Back in 1976, the science was so new that Bob's idea of starting a company around gene splicing, recombinant DNA, uh, was so bold that venture capitalists uh, responded to Bob by saying, we don't fund basic science research. That's what the NIH does. But Bob, being a partner at Kleiner Perkins, uh, talked Tom Perkins into writing a $200,000 check. Genentech was born. By lifting the usual veil of secrecy in product development, Genentech could recruit the very best scientists. Herb started the focus on allowing scientists to publish and having a very academic environment. Herbs was a relaxed um, style at the same time, uh, very thorough. And uh, I think the combination, again, was perfect for young scientists at Genentech who were, many of us were very competitive, wanted our own programs. Bob Swanson would say, okay guys, so this year what we're gonna do is we're gonna take Mount Rainier and we're gonna turn it on its head, then we're gonna t pile several of the mountains on top of it and paint them all blue, and I want you to have it done by Friday. And you say, good God, Bob, that's impossible. He said, well, let's go for it. And then you do it. The differences between Herb and Bob are, in fact, maybe the central reason for why the outcome was so extraordinarily exciting and so extraordinarily creative. Uh, Bob brought that passion about creating a business, uh, and Herb brought this enormous discipline uh, and, 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 and focus on scientific excellence uh, and understanding of what the science could in fact do. Growing Genentech in an industry dependent on the uncertain successes of blockbuster drugs, Swanson and Boyer navigated risk by building a broad research pipeline to seed future discoveries. Today, the results continue to emerge. In 2005, We've had a year, first half of the year, that was as successful in the clinic as we've ever seen, with five major phase three trials succeeding, one right on top of the other. Boyer and Swanson's legacy lives in the people they have mentored. These executives have built Genentech into the world's most successful biotech company and have founded dozens of other companies, establishing the Bay Area as the preeminent cluster for discovering life-saving biotech medicines.